You know, I love, Jesus was known as the master teacher because he taught so effectively. Um, he was good at it. And part of the reason that Jesus was such an effective teacher was because he could see into the heart of people and address the root of the problem, right? You know, I would love if somebody could just walk up to me and say, what must I do to be saved? And like this, you know, um, a few weeks ago, we were here soul winning. Well, no, this was back in Indiana where we're from. We were, we were home for a weekend and we went out soul winning and I met a guy named Joe and Joe was really excited to talk to us. He was very friendly and kind. We knocked on his door, my wife and I, and man, one of the great parts of getting married is you have a pretty lady to go soul winning with. And, uh, we knocked on his door, you know, just very kind, very happy to have a conversation with us about God. And he told us, he goes, yeah, I used to go back to church in the 90s, and it's been a long time. And we started talking with him, and he was agreeing with everything that we were saying, right? And so I start to give him the gospel, and he's nodding, and he's agreeing. He's going right along with me the whole entire time. And, and it's like a light bulb clicked on. And he stopped for a second, and he looked at me, and he goes, so wait, you're saying that you can continue to sin even after you've accepted Christ, and God's still going to forgive that sin and allow you into heaven. And I told him, I said, look, Joe, our salvation is not dependent on us. It is dependent on Jesus Christ and his finished work. So there is nothing I can do to change what Jesus has done. There's nothing I can do to save myself. It is what Jesus has done, and, and it's his perfect work that saves us and allows us to go to heaven. But there is nothing that we do that disrupts that. When God forgives us, he forgives us of everything, even the things we haven't done yet, because he sees our whole life, and he lives outside of time, right? He sees all of our sins, and we're forgiven of them. And he goes, I, I don't know. I don't think I can believe that. And, and I don't blame him, right? It's that sense of morality within us that says people shouldn't get away with stuff. And we feel like we're getting away with stuff, right? Because we are sinners. And the only reason we're saved is because of God's goodness, right? Not because of ours. And I talked to Joe, and we talked with him for a little while longer. He was still very friendly, very kind, uh, very happy to talk to us. And um, at the end, he didn't get saved. And we gave him our information, and, and hopefully still in the future, we'll be able to contact him again and lead him to the Lord. He goes, you've given me a lot to think about. And we went to many verses in the Bible to explain work salvation and how he had a wrong idea that his works could affect his destination. And um, then a couple weeks later, this was, we were at a church in Holland and uh, we were out soul winning with the people from their church. And we walked up to a door. I was with one of the men in the church and we knocked on the door and um, <clears throat> didn't get an answer from inside. But as we were stepping away from the porch, uh, a car pulled up into the driveway and this young man named Tavion got out. And we said, hey, we're just out here inviting people to church. Here's the information. If you'd ever like to come, we'd love to have you. And he goes, you know, my girlfriend and I have been talking about how we want to get into a church. He's like, Is, hey, can I go inside and bring her out? And, you know, you can tell us about this church and invite both of us. And, you know, my, my Baptist mouth is salivating. Like, yes, absolutely. Like, go get your girlfriend. I'd love to talk to both of you. And um, he went inside and brought her out. And I was able to give the gospel to the both of them. And they very sweetly very simply got saved. And they were ready to receive it right. Their heart was prepared. And it was literally just about sitting down and explaining to them what the Bible has to say. And they were ready to accept that. Um, I wish all of them were like that, right? I don't like the ones where we have to compel them, right? We still have a calling to compel them to come in. But there are those people that are so ready to get saved. And, and I look at this story of Christ and I think, man, this young man was so ready to get saved, Right? He's asking the important question. And Jesus, you know, seems to go off on this weird tangent, and even into what we think might be heretical doctrine, because this sounds a whole lot like work salvation, right? But Jesus, in his wisdom, the only wisdom that can come from God, sees into the heart of this man and identifies a problem that needs to be addressed. See, this young man comes to Jesus. Let's look here again, verse 17. And he says, this is the end of the verse, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You know, you read that and you sort of scratch your head like, Hold up, Jesus, you are God. But that was the answer to Jesus' question. See, that young man 
missed a very important point there. Jesus is saying, you are not good. No man is good except for God. You're calling me good. Why? And his answer should have been, because you are God. Because you are the Christ. You're not just a good master. You're not just a good teacher. You're not just a wise man. You are God, and that is why I can call you good. But notice that this young man immediately gets caught up in the idea of his own works, right? And Jesus has to address this because this young man is depending on himself and his own ability, his own resources. Because let's look here, and Jesus says in verse number 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered, this, this rich man answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And I don't think that he was necessarily lying. I think he was probably a very religious person, a very charactered person. I think he did his best to obey the law all through his life. But he did not see his sin for what it was. And he was too busy looking at the things that he had accomplished to almost act as an excuse for the sin that was in his own life. And Jesus sees this, and I think when the Bible says that Jesus loved him, if you want to disagree with me on this, fine. But I, I just, I see this as a moment of almost pity, where Jesus looks on him, and he cares for this man, and he says, I'm trying to teach you something, and it's not getting through. And so Jesus says, okay, one thing you lack. You've done a lot of good things in your life, but I want you to go and take everything that you own, sell it, give it to the poor, and then you'll have your, your questions answered. And Jesus finally hit the thing that this young man could not do. He was too concerned with his own good works, his own accomplishments, his own you know, good reputation and the fact that he follows the rules and he does what he's supposed to do. He's very dependent on his own ability to do what is right. And Jesus has found the thing that he cannot do in his own strength the thing that he falls short on, the thing that is going to become very evident to him that he is not good enough. And Jesus points to that sin that was existing in his heart, that sin of greed, that sin of lust, that desire that he had to have these things and to hold on to these things. And I find it so fascinating that here Jesus goes into a, a teaching mode with his disciples, right? And look what he says to them because they were all astonished. And, and Jesus there in verse number 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? You know, let's understand this fact. We in America are wealthy. We are rich. If you were to take the world's population and condense it down to 100 people, and you were to take all of the world's money and condense it down to $100, Americans would be four out of the hundred. All right, we're 4% of the world's population. Out of 100 people, there would be four Americans. You know how much of that $100 those four Americans hold? 30. A third of all the world's wealth lives within America. We are a wealthy people. That same 100 people, if we were to look at them, 55 out of that 100 would share $1. We are a wealthy people. And Jesus is trying to reveal something about faith because that's really what I want to talk tonight about is faith. Faith is an understanding that I need God that I cannot do it without him, that I'm reliant upon God. Many of us understand that faith is a requirement for salvation. We cannot rely on ourselves. We cannot have faith in ourselves to save ourselves. We need to be able to look to God and say, God, I am a depraved man. God, I am fallen in my sin. I cannot save myself and I need your help. And I'm trusting in you to help me. That is salvation. For by grace are you saved. It's because of God's goodness, but it's through your faith. 
You have to believe that he is. You have to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to have faith in God if you want salvation. And many of us here tonight, I hope every single one of us, already understand that fact and have accepted Christ as our Savior and put our faith in him. But so very often we as Christians no longer need faith to continue living our life for the Lord. We'll have it for salvation. We'll understand that we need God's help and we need faith in order to get saved. But we think we can manage the Christian life without God and without faith. See, money, money is a liar. It's a tool and it's not good and bad in and of itself. But Jesus, here in this passage, is pointing to the nature of man and what is in our heart, that when we have money, we feel secure. So many people, you know, we talked about this morning about our purpose in life and what we're going after. Many people are going after security. They're fearful of what could happen tomorrow, of what could happen next week, and they imagine, if, if I can... If I can buy a house that's nice enough, then my family will be able to survive the weather and we'll take care of them. And if I can set, if I can get a good enough job that I know a good paycheck is going to come in every week, then I can breathe and then I can relax and then my life will be settled and I'll have accomplished what I need to accomplish. Or if I can put enough money into a savings account that if something bad were to happen, I have the money to take care of it and I can meet that need if it surprises me, right? We want security. We chase security. We, we want that sense of no fear, right? We want to be able to live understanding that if something bad happens, we can take care of it. And money has a way of establishing a false sense of security in your heart that you feel because you have money, you can take care of yourself. Money can't take care of you. It's a false sense of security, right? Money can meet needs, but it is God who keeps you alive. It is God that keeps you healthy. It is God who, who blesses you in your life. Money is simply a tool. It is not the end all. But people who have money lack faith. And they do not see their need for God because they are relying on themselves. They are relying on their own talent, their own intellect, their own hardworking, you know, their own, their, their own character and their own ability to, to do the right thing. And many of us as Christians live our lives for the Lord within our own ability and without faith. Jesus makes it very clear that we need faith for salvation. And many of us understand that we need faith for salvation, but we leave it off there and we think my service to God, the way I live my life for him will be held within the confines of what I am capable of doing for myself. If you can wake up in the morning and not read your Bible and not pray, and by the end of the day, you're not a heretic you haven't fallen away from God. You haven't fallen into sin. You haven't left your wife and family and you're not a reprobate. If you can go through the day without God and survive, can I challenge you, Christian? It's because you're not doing what he's called you to do. God wants us to live by faith. You know, I, I was able to go to China before and be there for a while and for that year and it was an incredible time for me I learned so much you know you kind of think of the idea of a teenager right they're so scared to go to the BMV now do y'all call it the BMV here what is it called in, in Michigan DMV or I know there's a bunch of names for it oh okay well Hoosiers we have the BMV I think we're different not very many have the B there but we're Bureau of Motor Vehicles right and as a 16 year old you walk into the BMV and that place is terrifying right because it's all new, you don't have a lot of experience, you don't have a lot of wisdom there, and it seems very official, and it seems very important, and the idea of taking a driver's test terrifies you, right? And this whole idea of pushing and going out into something where you're a little bit scared, but it's important, right? And we know that, unfortunately, there are people who, like, still live with mom and dad because there are too many scary things out there, right? And... You know, the person that overcomes that fear, they become more used to it. And in many ways, that's kind of what happened for me in China. There was a lot of fear. I didn't know what it's like to be a missionary, what it's like to live on the field. I wanted to get the reality of it. 
What is it really like to live there? What is it really like to eat there? What is it actually like? And answered a lot of my questions, being able to be there for that amount of time and made it very clear that it's God's will for me. And I'm so thankful for it. And then we came back to the States and things escalated in China and got more difficult. And we had to change our plans from what, you know, we, what I had already been doing, right? And we sat down with our missions director and we talked about how we were going to get back into China and how potentially I may need to start a business of my own to be able to get into the country. Now, can I tell you, that scares me. I've never started a business. I don't know how that works. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to succeed in that. And, and it's dependent on my family having a place to live, right? Us being able to get into the country to get settled and for them to be taken care of. And I have to make these plans and I have to sort these things out. And it got bigger and bigger and it got heavier and heavier on my shoulders through the length of that conversation. And I thought, man, how am I going to compete with the Chinese government, right? Right. How how am I going to win the largest country in the world to Christ? God, this is a heavy burden on my shoulders. And can I tell you, that's where God wants us. We need God. We need God. We need faith in God to be able to live our lives for him. And there is a real temptation for the Christian to pull in their borders and build a life around what they can handle by themselves. I can teach a Sunday school class. I can lead a bus route. That is well within my capability. And you know what? I could probably even get up and not read my Bible and not pray, not seek God's face and do it in my own strength and in my own power, in my own ability And I could do those things for God without his help. And I would be living without faith. But sometimes God wants to take us into scary areas of life where we're sinking. We're going under. We are out of our depth. It is beyond our ability to do what he has asked us to do. Because what God wants us to see, like he was trying to get this rich man to see, is you need me. The truth is, I need God to teach a Sunday school class. And I need God to run a bus route. And I need God to brush my teeth. And I need God to put on my clothes. And I need God to drive my car. And I need God in every area of my life. And God will push us into scary places to understand the thing that we've been ignoring. And that's that we need God. We need faith. Faith makes a difference in the life of a Christian. When we live by faith, when the idea, maybe I'm I'm talking about how easy it is to teach a Sunday school class, right? I've done it for a number of years. And you're sitting there thinking, easy? What's this guy talking about? The idea of having to get up and lead these kids, right? Keep them from tearing stuff off the wall and throwing chairs out the window. And, you know, teaching a Sunday school class is scary. And I don't, I don't think I could do that. That's not something that I am capable of. I'm trying to tell you here tonight that God is most likely calling you to do something that is beyond your ability so that you will be compelled to fall on your knees and seek his face and ask for his help and include him in what you are doing for him. God wants faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. God wants us to be willing to say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. But I'm going to step forward in faith. I'm going to act in obedience. I'm going to do what you're calling me to do, even though it's scary, because I know it's going to draw me closer to you. And I know that I'm going to have to live in faith. I'm going to have to wake up in the morning and say, Jeremiah Smith cannot reach the entire country of China. See, what's this verse here? 27. And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. When we live by faith, God takes the measly rags that we offer and God multiplies them. And God takes the temporal 
and the empty and the vain things that we give and that we contribute. He takes the fish and the bread and he multiplies and he does a miracle and he takes what we offer to him and he turns it into the impossible. And that God can take what we give to him in faith and he can turn it into something that cannot be explained. That he can take your offering, that he can take your service, that he can take what you give to him and multiply it and turn it into something eternal. Turn it into something greater than you. But God requires faith. And faith makes a difference in the life of a Christian when we're willing to fall on our knees and say, God, I've got to get in the Bible because I can't do what I'm supposed to do today without your help. You know, I wonder sometimes, I don't, I don't like lettuce. And it's a big, I hate it. I wish I did. Man, my wife, she's great. She eats salad all the time and I look at her salad. I don't like lettuce. So I'm that guy that every time we go to a restaurant, I have to say, no lettuce, please. Put the lettuce on the side, take it off, right? And I actually like Taco Bell. The older I get, the less it likes me. But I went to Taco Bell one time, and I told them, no, no lettuce on my tacos, right? Because Taco Bell lettuce, all right, who's with me? It's even worse than normal lettuce, right? And it's like I, I open up the bag, and I can just smell the lettuce in there. Like it's awful stuff, right? So I tell them, no lettuce on my taco, please. And I... At Taco Bell, I, I take my bag of food all the way home with me, and I get home, and I'm very excited to eat. I've been hungry, right? And so I sit down, and I open up my taco, and there is lettuce inside my taco. And it's just the worst. And I'm very disappointed because I'm hungry, and it's late, and I want to eat my food. And so I'm like, I am going to eat this taco, and I'm going to sit down here, and I'm going to pick out every little strand of lettuce in my taco, and I'm going to eat this taco. And so I did. I sat down there and meticulously, I went through that thing and I pulled out every strand of lettuce that I could find and I'm sorting through the meat and cheese and every piece of lettuce I took out and set to the side. And you know what happened? When I got all the lettuce out of my taco, I looked down and it's just a tortilla. <laughs> Man. All those bits of meat, all those bits of cheese are entangled and twisted up in every piece of lettuce that I just pulled out of there. So I've got nothing left. <laughs> I mean a tortilla for dinner, right? Everybody, aw, isn't that sad? Yeah. Thank you. Now imagine, you know, I go to a restaurant and get a burger, and I tell them no lettuce. And I get a sandwich, and it has lettuce on it, but it's a leaf lettuce, right? And I can just take off the bun, pull off that lettuce leaf, put my bun back on top, and I've got a burger I can eat. It's as simple as that, right? Tell me, if you decided today that you didn't want to be a Christian any longer and you removed God from your life, what would it look like after you did it? Removing God from your life, is it going to be a Sunday morning and then the rest of your week looks exactly the same? Is it going to be Sunday? If you're a real good Christian, is it going to be Sunday and Wednesday night? And those nights, those days will change, but everything else remains the same. How much is God a part of your life that if you had to take him out, that there would be very little or a whole lot left? See, God, we need him. We don't just need him for salvation. We need him to live. And God will take us to scary places that requires our faith to show us that need for him to include him in every moment of the day, to bring the Holy Spirit with us everywhere that we go. Just a few points here tonight and we'll be finished. Faith makes a difference. When we live by faith, it changes things. It adds to things. It multiplies things. It increases. It makes them more meaningful. It gives them more depth. Faith Number one, makes a difference in salvation. We've already talked about that, and that's obvious to many of us. You cannot get saved without faith. Faith makes a difference in salvation. Number two, faith makes a difference in sacrifice. Let's take our Bibles to Luke chapter 6.
Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Do you believe God's promises? Do you have faith in God that when he says he will do something, that he will actually do it? God says that your giving here will be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give into your bosom. That God will use this world and he will use people in this world that when you give a sacrifice to him, it will be given back to you above and beyond what you have given. You know what that means? When you put your offering in the offering plate, God says that not only do you have rewards in heaven, not only do you have that set up in heaven for you in the future, but here on earth will men give into your bosom, will God return back to you in good measure what you have given to him, pressed down, shaken together, above and beyond. God says that when you give to him, he will give back to you more than what you gave. Do you believe that? You know, we can be up to date on the news and on the stock market and you can have authorities in your life that you trust that when they say invest in this, you do it because you can count on their wisdom. Do you, do you believe in God's wisdom? When God says that when you give to him, that your sacrifice is set aside in a place where moth and rust can't corrupt, where thieves can't break through and steal. Do you believe God that when he says that when you give to him, he blesses you back above and beyond what you have given because that's what he promises us. And when we give in faith to God, then God takes that and he, he, he multiplies it and he increases it and he gives us back so much more than what we invested. What you give to missions, what you give to your church, God takes that and he uses it in an incredible way, but it has to be done in faith. Let's be honest. Tithing is easy. And I, I, I hope I didn't upset anybody by saying that. And I'm not saying that everybody has it easy and everybody can pay their bills easily and everybody has all the money that they need. God doesn't ask you for an amount. He asks you for a percentage, right? Everybody can live off of 90% of their income. Haven't we proven it recently? You know, I don't like inflation. <laughs> We have had to increase our grocery budget consistently every month for the last several months. And it's getting tighter and tighter, and you know, I'm feeling it, believe me. But we still made it here, didn't we? I haven't missed a meal yet. There's gas in our car. Now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we can live off of 90% of our income. We can make it work. But faith isn't putting your tithe in the offering plate every week like you've always done in obedience to God, doing exactly what he's told you to do. Faith is when God tells you specifically. This isn't a commandment he gives to everybody, but faith is when God says, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. Now, if you're doing that without God's leading, you're not spiritual. You're a fool. Because God doesn't, if you sell all of your things and go sit on the street corner and say, well, I'm praying that God pays all my bills. No. God was going to pay your bills through your job and through an able body and how he's helped and worked and moved. But if God were to tell you that, would you have the faith to do it? If you see a need in your church and God pricks your heart and you go, well, man, God, like, I already paid my tithe. I already paid what I'm supposed to do. And now, God, you're asking me to give out of an area where now I have some fear. Because you have asked me to give this, especially, God, your spirit spoke and moved. There's a special need. Somebody needs help. Somebody needs me to give. And you told me to. And out of fear, I said no. And often as Christians, we give of our money 
without faith. We give what we can always afford. I'm not here tonight to tell you what you're supposed to be giving, but it should be a warning sign to you if you've given for the last 20 years and never wondered if God was going to meet your needs. If you've never given in faith, that there's never been a time that God has asked you to give to the point where it's a little bit scary, where you go, oh, God, if I do this, you're going to have to step up and meet my needs. But we pull back and we pull back and we do for God what we can manage without God. And we order our obedience and our service and what we do for him. Specifically, we rein into those areas where we can handle it. That if for some reason God doesn't step up and fulfill his promise, I'm still okay because I can handle this. Are we living by faith? Faith makes a difference in salvation. Faith makes a difference in sacrifice. When you give with faith, it changes things. It changes how you give, and it changes what God does with your giving. And that when you step out, you'll see the miracles of God. I want to have stories in my life to tell my children of where we gave because God led us to give, and we saw God answer prayers, and we saw God, you know, somebody left groceries on our doorstep that month, and, and somebody did this for us, and something miraculously happened, and, you know, our car, like the widow's jar, had no gas in it, and now it's full of gas, right? And, but that God meets our needs because we gave in faith. If you're not giving in faith, God's not going to need to provide any miracles. And your life will accomplish very little for him. You may not be the worst Christian, but you will not be accomplishing what he has called you to do. Because God calls us to faith. He will always lead us to a place beyond our ability Faith makes a difference in salvation. Faith makes a difference in sacrifice. Faith makes a difference in supplication. The Bible tells us we don't have to turn there. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Do we believe that God answers prayer? Do we pray like it? All right, God, I'm supposed to pray. So I'm going to sit down here. I've got my list written out. I'm going to go through the list, but let's be honest, God. You're not going to answer my prayers because I'm not as good as some of these other Christians. Lord, I messed up today. I messed up yesterday. I messed up last week. God, I am not that great, and I know you probably don't like me that much right now, so you're not going to answer any of my prayers anyway. So let's just get this through. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to pray these prayers, but I don't have any faith you're going to answer it. And the Bible does tell us that it is the prayer of a righteous man that is very effectual, right? It avails much. The, a righteous person does have more standing with God. But prayers that are answered are not dependent on the person who is praying. They are dependent on the God who answers prayer. You don't pray in faith because of your standing and because of your goodness, you pray understanding the goodness of God. And that when you talk to him, say, God, you have promised me that you will answer. And maybe I'm not going to like the answer, but God, I want to see something happen when I pray this prayer. And that if we can fall on our knees and pray and have supplication with God with faith, where it's not rote, it's not a chore, it's not what we do in our own strength, but we fall on our knees and we say, God, I'm praying not because I'm supposed to, but because, God, I need you. God, I have to have your help. God, there's this man that has passed away that has a burden for his family who is, who, who is not saved, who won't even darken the door of a church. God, he wants to see his family saved and you want to see his family saved and there's a great need and God, I believe that you will do something and I'm asking you to do something. And then when we pray in faith, when we add that in, it makes a difference. And God takes our prayers that are pointless, 
that accomplish nothing. And he takes what we give to him and he multiplies it. And his spirit works and moves. And God does incredible things because he is incredible. And God does what is impossible because he is God. And God takes our faith and he turns it into something that matters for all eternity. And some of us are never willing to step into that scary space and live by faith and we just do what we can manage. We just put on our to-do list what we can do in our own strength without God's help and we never live by faith. God wants us to live by faith. We need God whether we realize it or not. Faith makes a difference in salvation. Faith makes a difference in sacrifice. Faith makes a difference in supplication. And faith makes a difference in service. Many a times I've gone out to share the gospel with people. And I, and I say this because I really, I really believe it. God, it is not my logic. It is not my charm. It's not my ability to convince somebody that is going to lead this person to you. God, if this person is going to get saved through my obedience of going and knocking on their door and starting a conversation, but if something real is going to happen in their heart, God, I can't do this without you. I can't do this in my own talent, in my own intellect, through my resources, through what I can accomplish. Don't limit your service to God in what you are already capable of handling on your own. Allow God to lead you in service to him to a place where you feel a little bit scared and you have to fall on your knees and you have to seek his face because if you don't, you're going to fail. Are you willing to let God lead you into a place like that? We need to live by faith. Are we even letting God bring us to a place where we become aware of that? I'm not, I'm not standing up here tonight as somebody that has it figured out, that has done all of this in my life consistently. I'm speaking to you as somebody that has a desire to live by faith, even though I don't always do it. And because God has commanded us to, are we attuned to the Holy Spirit? Are we seeking the face of God? Do we want his help? Or would we rather be lazy and say, God, yeah, I don't want you because I don't want to do anything. God has given so very much to us. And we have a short time that he has asked us to work in service for him, to do his work here in this world. And that means we need to be a people who give. We need to be a people who pray. We need to be a people who serve. And for this time, let God lead us to a place where we are living by faith and understanding that God, God, we need you. We cannot do this without you. Let's pray.